Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Zemieski. I'm the Extension Educator in for Purdue Extension in Perry County, Indiana. And today I have with me my colleague, Alicia Rogers, who is the Ag and Natural Resources Educator for Purdue Extension in DeKalb County, Indiana. And we had planned on having graduate student Matt Asmus, who spoke with us last time, to speak again, but unfortunately he was not available. So today you get us to share with you on weaning and finishing lambs and goats. So Alicia, do you wanna go ahead? Certainly. So our objectives today are just gonna be walk through kind of these four items. So we'll talk about kind of weaning methods, looking at both kids and lambs. We'll look at grain finishing methods. We'll look at grass finishing. And then we'll look at show finishing for so those of you that show for 4-H or on open circuits, we'll cover that a little bit as well. So when we talk about weaning lambs and goats, there are various strategies for weaning. So when we're talking about weaning a goat kid, we're usually looking at a weaning range of about 60 to 90 days of age. And that's because rumen development you know, is complete at approximately eight weeks. You, know, you may have some kids that will finish room development faster and some slower, and that'll depend a lot on what they're exposed to early in life. And so if they're not exposed to roughages and grains early on, then the rumen is going to develop more slowly. And so and that may be desirable in some cases if you are breeding for specific markets where they want a milk fed kid. And so if you're wanting a milk fed kid, you are not weaning at all. You are exposing this kid to as little you know, outside feed as possible so that you can keep it on milk as long as possible without that room in development. But we're going to see, you know, you have different types of goat operations. And so if you're talking about a, a dairy goat that's in a commercial operation, you're going to be pulling those kids at birth and then you're going to be hand feeding and then weaning as early as is feasible. And because it, you know, that's a lot of work to hand raise kids and it's also a lot of expense and the, and also if you have a market meat go up good operation and you have does that you're trying to get bred back you're probably going to wean on the earlier end of that spectrum because you want them to get the body your body condition back up for rebreeding and so it really depends on your operation now if you are somebody who you want to raise as naturally as possible, and you want to, as little stress on the kids as possible, then you're going to want to wean later. And so it really depends on what the goals are for your operation. And so when you're making these decisions, you need to consider your markets. Where are you marketing these animals? What's the weight? About 30 pounds is the minimum weight, but it really depends on your breed. Because if you have a pygmy goat, the weaning weight's gonna be a lot lower for a pygmy than it will be for a boar. And so it's hard to put a specific weight for weaning goats when you have such a wide variety in mature sizes of these different breeds of goats. And so you're gonna consider the market, you're gonna consider the weight of the kid for the breed and the health of the doe when you're assessing when to wean this animal. There are cases where you have to have very early weaning. And so kids can be weaned potentially as soon, you know, as soon as they are consistently eating solids. But it's not ideal. You know, if you don't have that full room in development, then they're not going to grow as well. They may be end up stunted. So it's not the ideal, but if you have an orphan that is already eating solids, you know, maybe you have a four week old orphan. It's really not an ideal age for weaning, but it can be done. And you may lose some growth there, but in general, if they're eating solids, then they generally will be okay if they refuse to take a bottle. But if they're not eating solids yet, you don't want to attempt to wean them at all. And so or you have a doe that's in poor condition. You know, say she had a really, maybe you had a really rough winter. She's just, she's in poor body, has a poor body condition score, two or below. And she just really needs that, you know, the, that extra, she does not need to have these kids drain, drawing her down and, and draining her energy. And so if you have a, a kid that's, you know, again, they are eating solids well, they seem to be doing well, 
you might be able to wean a little bit early, you know, some extra supportive feed to be able to, to relieve that dough a little bit, improve her body condition score, get her to where she's ready to breed back, you know, in that body condition score of a three, three and a half. And then again, you have commercial dairies. Milk replacer is really expensive. And the labor involved in, even if you're bucket feeding, you know, all of these kids, that's a lot of labor involved. And so you might consider weaning on the very early side if you're in a commercial dairy situation. And then on the opposite extreme, we have dam lead weaning. So these are animals where they, they may be on their pasture, their mother's four to six months old. Some will even nurse longer, depending on if you are on the dough and, and what, her, what her tolerance is in nursing. I have some that they will just wean their kids right at eight weeks. They do not like having these big kids coming after them and they will kick them off. There are others that I've, would, I have had to separate because they've let their yearling kids nurse. So you have, I mean, you have all kinds of extremes. So, but in general, dam lead weaning is gonna decrease the stress on both the dough and the kids. But if you are, you know, again, if you're in a dairy situation, you're not gonna have as much milk, but that may be desirable. You know, if, my situation, I work full time. And so it takes less time for me to milk if I, if the kids are taking some of the milk. And so it works for to have, in my situation to have damn wood weaning. But, you know, in a meat goat situation, you aren't going to get as many litters. You know, so I know a lot of the meat goat breeders have the goal of three litters in two years. You may not be able to get that with damn wood weaning. You might get two litters in two years. And so it just kind of really depends on what your goals are. So if your goal is number of kids, then you might want to, you know, wean yourself and not do the dam, dam lead weaning. But if you really want them to be, you know, have reduced stress and do it as natural as possible, this may be an attractive method for you. But know that even that with dam lead weaning, there may be the occasional doe that never weans your kids on her own. And so you will have to monitor that. But the vast majority of them will, and usually it'll be anywhere between eight weeks and 16 weeks of age is usually about when they will wean. Maybe they'll go a little bit longer, but they, they typically naturally wean themselves by, by six months. But again, you always have the exceptions. So, this is for lambs. All right. So... Lambs are pretty similar um, to raising our goats when in terms of weaning. So obviously our weaning can occur in many different ways, um, similar to what Sarah talked about on the goats. So some of our sheep producers like to wean early, um, could be multiple reasons. Um, so you like, basically, um, it's more efficient for the lamb um, to be fed directly. Um, so grain and things like that, than it is to feed the ewe that feed and then have the ewe produce the milk and then have the lamb eat that milk. So you're taking out kind of that direct step in between. So normally early weaning on lambs is gonna be about 60 days old. Um, and usually they should weigh about 45 pounds. Again, this is gonna depend on your breed. So you get some of your little bit smaller breeds. So something like a, um, a Texel or um, Yep, lost it. <laughs> the ones with the red heads and red legs. Um, so you have those types versus something like a crossbred. So it could be a Suffolk, a Hamp, something like that, that are going to be naturally a larger frame anyways. All right. So sometimes, um, like we said, we will need to wean earlier. Um, sometimes it could be that there's a drought going on. Um, kind of up here in northern Indiana last year, um, we had a drought pretty much all summer, and we're technically still in abnormally dry, if not slightly droughty conditions up here. Um, so we may not have the same for same amount of forages available. So we may want to get that U back up to a good body condition, like we said, um, or we may not have the feed available, so we need to sell those animals. And then there may be the desire to breed the ewes um, back more quickly, um, similar to what Sarah said on some of our meat goats. Same could be said with some of our hair sheep. 
Um, they can be bred back about three times in two years if you want to push it. Um, so you may want to get that U back up to a good body condition score. So with the really early lead weaning, the lambs are usually about 30 to 45 days old. Um, and this can sometimes lead to a challenge when we're trying to dry off the ewes um, because normally our ewes are gonna be most um, productive in terms of milk production at about three to four weeks old. So at 30 days old, we're at that four week peak in milk production. So it's gonna take longer. It's gonna be a little bit harder to dry our ewes off. So we can also look at lambs that are raised on milk replacer. Um, so similar to the goats, milk replacer is expensive. Um, it's, it's not cheap. We've had to buy, well, we raised primarily goats, but we had to buy a couple bags of milk replacer this year and they were $70 a piece. Um, so it can get pricey. Um, granted, it's less expensive than buying like gallons of milk in the store to equal that much milk. But still, um, if you can get that lamb off of the milk a little bit earlier, um, if they're eating roughages and grain and things like that without a problem, then it would be okay to wean them at a little bit earlier age. And then similar to the goats, we have the natural lead weaning method. Um, so these lambs are gonna stay on their moms until they're about four to six months old. Um, usually a lot more often this is gonna be done in a pasture type situation. So if you lamb on the pasture, this would probably be more of a natural method um, to your system potentially. So it definitely greatly decreases the stress um, for both the ewes and the lambs, but it can also mean lower weight gains in lambs because they're not maybe, they may be doing some grazing, things like that on their own, but they have that natural source of food coming from their mothers. So they're not gonna be as interested in eating other things on their own unless they're shown and unless they they are made to go and eat something else. So, next slide, please. All right, and then to decrease our stress to our lambs or kids, if we are weaning early, um, we want to move the ewes or does from that pen because um, naturally the lambs and kids should remain in that pen. That's what they're familiar with. Um, that's what they've been raised up to at that point. So it's home for them. That's where they, they're familiar. They know where their feed is. They know where their water is. So it's not as much of an adjustment for those lambs and kids as it is if we were to take the lambs and kids out and leave the ewes and does. Um, the ewes and does are old enough. They should be able to figure out where food and water is without much problem. But those kids and lambs need, need that little bit of comfort to them. Um, and then we'll typically have less decrease in feed and water consumption, equaling less weight loss when we leave the kids in those pens because they're familiar with the surroundings. And in a lot of these cases, you may actually see the, the you or the doe may appear more stressed than the lambs or kids do because they're playing like they normally would. And as long as, you know, again, if they were ready to be weaned, then, you know, they're eating, so they're not really hungry. And, you know, may, maybe every once in a while they may look for mom, but it's, but a lot of times it's mom that's more stressed than, than the kid or the lamb. And I, I have actually had does that would jump fences to get back with their kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. So you want to take and Sarah? So, yeah. So since since weaning is such a stressful time, you want to make sure that you do any medical procedures, you know, your vaccinations, your deworming, your castration, your tagging, you know, well before you actually wean. So a couple of weeks before you plan to wean, make sure that they are fully vaccinated and that these other procedures are done. And now just to get a, a plug in here. We don't want to deworm everything on a schedule. So make sure you are using integrated parasite management when you're deworming, but you have, but have your integrated parasite management plan. And so maybe you are evaluating fecals or, or eyelids and determining which ones need to be dewormed. So make sure you are, you know, following your IPM plan when you're doing it and not just deworming across the board. And, but again, if you cannot do these medical procedures a couple of weeks before weaning, wait until several weeks after weaning once the kids or lambs 
are well adjusted to living without their mothers. So you don't want to stress them additionally by removing them from their mother and then doing all these medical procedures all at one time, because then you're going to have more stress. And so because these, these kids or lambs are going to be under more stress, they're going to be more susceptible to disease. And that could include things like pneumonia or scours. And especially if, you know, you're changing feed, you know, you're removing milk as a feed source. And so if not, even if you're not changing anything else, you are changing feed. So the combination of changing feed and stress is going to make them more susceptible to scours and coccidiosis. And so scours are usually caused by an imbalance in the microbes in the digestive tract. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that they've picked up new microbes, but because they're under stress, the microbes that cause scours are able to take over in the digestive tract. And, and that includes the your coccidia. All right. So we've talked a little bit about the lambs and the kids, but what should we do when we're looking at the mothers? So for ewes, you want to prepare those ewes or your meat goats as well, your meat does, um, kind of several days before you plan on weaning. So that's going to be things like starting to remove any grain. Um, like Matt had talked about last time, switching to a lower quality hay. Um, things like that where you are um, basically dropping that amount of protein because the less protein they have, the less milk they're going to be want to make basically. Um, so some producers may actually also limit water for about 24 hours after weaning. I would caution on this, um, especially if we're getting into kind of that June, July time frame when you're weaning, um, because those ewes and does need that water. Um, water is the most essential thing for them. So I'd caution on limiting the water, but definitely removing the grain, definitely offering that lower quality hay um, because it does decrease those protein and energy levels. And so you want to keep them um, on that lower quality hay for a few weeks um, until you start seeing those udders start shrinking and drying up. Um, kind of after the first few days, start looking at the udders. If you notice some that appear to be more swollen, um, if they haven't started to drop down any, um, if the U acts uncomfortable, it may be that she has starting to have mastitis, so you want to get that taken care of. Um, you may need to milk them out a little bit, not the, uh, the entire way, because if you milk them out the entire way, they're going to want to produce more milk to fill back up. So you can relieve some of that pressure, but not completely empty the udder. Um, and then any of our ewes that are weaned from about 68 day old lambs or older, don't really need their water withheld because typically by then they should be naturally drying off um, unless they're naturally heavy milkers, in which case you may need to hold a little bit of water. So when we look at goats, you know, it's a little bit different situation because a fairly large percentage of the goats that we have are, are dairy goats. And so now, a lot of our dairy goats, you know, they, if they're in a commercial setting or even a lot of your show breeders are going to be pulling the kids at birth and bottle raising. So in this case, there's, you know, you're not worried about the doe at all at weaning because, you know, she's already been away from her kids for a while and she's being milked regularly. But if you, if you have dairy goats and you've been dam raising and you wish to, and you want to keep milking, you need to maintain the same feed that you were when they were raising kids. But in this case, so I know that a lot of people who will raise, they who will dam raise, they might go, they might go to a once, a, they might be on a once a day milking schedule. Well, when you're ready to wean those kids, you're going to need to put these does on a twice a day milking schedule until they start to drop production because you don't want them to get over uttered. And so there's, you know, because if they're used to having their utter drained multiple times a day by these kids, then you will need to, you know, make sure that you are continuing to milk them at least twice a day to relieve that pressure. And if you are dam raising with dairy goats, make sure that, that they are being, you know, nursed out evenly, because that's a problem we see a lot with dairy goats, especially if they have a single kid, 
is that they will prefer one side over the other. And so you can end up with uneven udders, dairy goats. So those are some considerations with those, with dairy goats that are being, with kids that are being dam raised at weaning. And so meat goats is gonna be very similar to, you know, weaning off of ewes. And so you wanna start by reducing the quality of diet. Like Alicia said, so they're, you know, both the protein and the energy, if you reduce both protein and energy, then it's gonna trigger them to produce less milk because they need to conserve those resources. And so since they need to conserve resources, they're not gonna be putting out as many resources in the milk. And so removing the grain and switching to a lower quality hay can go a long way towards telling their body, hey, we don't need to be putting this out anymore. Seasons changed. It's time to be weaning these kids. Okay, now what Alicia talk a little bit about grain finishing. So when we refer to the word finished, um, basically what we're referring to as is the lamb or goat carcass has the right relationship between bone, meat, and fat. Um, now some breeds are going to definitely finish out faster than others. Um, so for example, when we're looking at something like on the goat side of it, if, if you chose to eat something like a Nigerian dwarf, that's going to finish out a whole lot faster than if you were to finish out something like a Sanin, which is going to be the big white dairy goats. On the sheep side, on the lamb side, um, something like the little, um, something like a little Texel um, may have a very square body, but definitely has a smaller, more compact body. And they're going to finish out a little bit sooner than something like a larger framed Suffolk or a large crossbred or a Hampshire. So you want to have that relationship between the bone, the meat, and the fat to get a good cover. So this is an example here. Um, Left-hand side is a lamb that we had butchered. Um, she is She was probably about 115 pounds um, live weight when we butchered her. And on the right, we have a goat carcass um, from a goat that we hung as well. And he was probably about 90 pounds um, live weight. So you can see here we have some pretty good, you can't see it that well, but some fairly good fat cover along the back. Not too much fat, um, but you can still see some of the meat and such. Um, so for me, um, these animals finished out perfectly fine for what we wanted for our freezer. Next. All right, so we're going to take a moment and be honest. Um, so when we're looking at grain feeding or grain finishing, basically we're going to need these things to get it done properly. So we're going to need to look at facilities. Usually this is going to occur in a barn, um, in a shed type area. Um, when we're looking at something like a feedlot type finishing. You want grain handling and storage areas. Um, if you don't have an area to finish or to store all the grain that you need to finish these animals, it's going to be a lot more difficult having 50 pound bags at a time brought in. You're going to have daily feeding. Um, so with these, it's going to be handled. Um, you're going to come in two, one or two times a day, um, feed them, check the feeders to make sure they're getting, getting the amount of feed that they need. Um, you're going to have water lines and waters um, or buckets, things like that. So you're going to be refreshing the water a couple times a day. You're going to have these feed bunk feeding areas. Um, you're going to have bedding that needs to take, be replaced and refreshed. And you're going to have manure that you're going to have to handle. Um, so those are the things that you're going to have to look at. Um, so it's going to be, be a little bit more manpower potentially for a grain feeding finish. Next slide, or next slide. So when we're finishing lambs, even when we're finishing kids, it's gonna be fairly similar on a diet like this. So we're gonna look at a high quality feed and plenty of fresh, clean water. That's key. Um, lambs also need to be free from disease and parasite to help maintain their health. So obviously if an animal isn't feeling well, um, if they have a parasite or they might be coming down with pneumonia, they're just not gonna to wanna to eat a lot. So that's gonna be a key thing to watch out for. We need to watch out for our predators as well. Um, so just because those animals are in the barn doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely safe from predators. 
So we need to watch that. Um, watch for large holes, doors being left open at night or even during the day um, because coyotes could still get in. Um, if you have wild dogs running around, those can be concerns as well. And so our feedlot lambs is what we're going to be referred to as our grain finished. They're going to be fed a high concentrate ration to grow quickly. So it's going to be a little bit higher protein, higher total digestible nutrients, things like that, to just kind of get all the energy, um, the growth into those lambs and kids um, needed um, to get them to their weight, their desired weight, a little bit faster. And so they're going to actually consume more when it's colder, just like us. Um, we want to consume more to keep our energy up, to keep our body um, temperatures up versus when it's hot. Um, when it's hot, I'm more than happy to just sit down and eat a popsicle and call it good for the day. <laughs> um, I really, really don't need a whole lot more than that. Um, so it's kind of similar with us. Um, so they'll eat more when it's cold, less when it's hot. Next slide. All right, and so there are a couple types of grain finished, especially feedlot type feeding. So we have the bunk line feeding, like you can see here. Um, it's definitely higher maintenance, higher output, um, and it has a lot of different variable feed costs. So it definitely depends on what you're feeding, what those rations are, what you're mixing into those rations as to what the cost will be, especially now um, with corn and bean prices increasing quite a bit. Um, that's definitely changed the price of our of our feed. Um, so that's something to consider. So usually you'll have a variety of feeds to mix together um, in your finished ration. Um, normally this is gonna be done on, it can be done on smaller operations, but a lot of the bunk line styles are done on a lot of the larger operations. So they'll typically have a mixer wagon where they're mixing a lot of their own feed. So you can use things like grain. So your corn, your beans, your wheat, um, products like that. Silage, so chopped corn, um, could be chopped hay that they're using as well. Um, could They're also including a mineral package. Um, so they're getting the correct balance of minerals. And you can also use other byproducts like distiller's grain or beet pulp, things like that to help feed in the bunk, um, to help with that protein and that energy. But basically they come through once or twice a day with these big mixer carts and it's like feeding cattle on a feedlot. They drop into these bunk lines, the animals come and eat as they want um, and finish it up. And if there's feed left over at the end of the day, typically that gets thrown into a compost pile um, because they just want that cleaned out and fresh and ready to go for the next feeding. Next slide. All right, and then we have our self feeders. So these are a lot more low maintenance. Um, they provide good production, have higher feed costs, um, because for us, the self feeders are gonna be those, kind of look like dog feeders, um, self dog feeders. So you put the feed in and the animals come and eat as they want to um, and, and then leave. So they're definitely more restricted in terms of how much grain you can feed, because there can be some, some times where it gets stuck up there in the feeder, um, so it can be a little bit harder to feed some of our grains. Typically, it's going to be corn with a type of pellet added, but we'll talk about kind of pellets here in a little bit as to why we need to caution on using too many of those. Um, but normally, our final diet when we're looking at self feeders is going to be about 80 to 90 percent concentrate, so our, our higher energy food, our protein, and then about a 10 to 20 percent pellet. Um, so when we're starting out with a self feeder, if this is the route we choose to go, we're gonna kind of look at what's called the rule of 10. So we're gonna start with only about a 10 to 20% of our feed mixture being this concentrate that we're going to use. And then for every 10 pounds um, that have been consumed, um, so if we're feeding 20 pounds um, of concentrate, we're going to increase how much we're feeding by 10%. So if we start out with 10% concentrate, if they're completely polishing that off and we need to increase it more, then we'll increase it to 20% concentrate. If they start finishing that off, we'll increase it to 30% is kind of how that rule of 10 works. You just increase it by 10% at a time. Next slide. All right, and then like Sarah led to or mentioned before, 
We need to be cautious when we're blending new grains or new feed. So when we're taking these kids and lambs off their moms um, and transferring them over to kind of a full grain based diet, we kind of need to slowly work on kind of mixing or crossing them over. So kind of that first step is going to be that creek diet that they should have been on in the pen um, with the ewes or with the does where they had access to the grain, um, something that they're familiar with. Um, this could be something like our starter feed. So usually it's going to be a, the highest percent protein that we'll feed. So something along 17% crude protein, and we'll have about 85% total digestible nutrients. So that's going to be a lot of nutrients that those kids and lambs are getting from the feed. Um, plus, usually there's a little bit of molasses in there to help with some of the taste to get them used to it. <clears throat> Once those kids or lambs reach about 60 pounds or so, um, or about probably about a month or so after weaning, um, you're going to look at dropping it down to about a 15 to 16 percent crude protein, um, about 80 to 85 percent total digestible nutrients, because at that point they're going to be 12 to 16 weeks old. So we're looking at three to four months old. So they're still putting on quite a bit of weight, quite a bit of muscling, but we don't need them growing exponentially at that point. <clears throat> and then once we get those animals close to where we want them to be for our final um, kind of market weight. So once they get over about that 90 to 100 pounds, we kind of need to slow them down a little bit. Um, so they're not expending or increasing um, a lot of energy. Um, they aren't putting on a lot of protein. We're just kind of trying to finish them off at that point without adding a lot of fat. So we're gonna add about 13 to 14% crude protein and about 75 to 85% total digestible nutrients. So we need to keep those TDNs up a little bit higher um, throughout the grain finish just because um, we need those nutrients in those animals. And just to note that these weights are not exact. It's going to depend Correct. on the breed of sheep or goat that you're working with. And you yep. may have different finish weight goals depending on your breed and depending on your market. Because yep. again, this is this is a you know the classic lamb that you find in the grocery store or what these guidelines are for. Mm -hmm. But if you are growing for you know an Easter market, you don't want a lamb that's going to be you know, 90, 100 pounds or 125 pounds at market. You want a 50 pound, you know, live weight, 50, 60 pound live weight lamb or kid. And so you just really need to know your markets, know your breed and what your targets are for finishing for your market and your breed. Yep. Thank you. So, all right, so this is kind of a, an example of what you can do to help transition that diet over from the old ration to the new ration. I mean, you're only changing one, one or two percent protein, but that's still a change in their diet. Their rumen has to get used to adjusting to it. So if you know, if you're looking at what feed you have left and you know you have about a week's worth of feed left, um, this is when you would go ahead and start transitioning them over. So the first couple of days, you're going to have about 75% of the old feed and start mixing in about 25% of the new feed. Kind of the middle of the week, you're going to have about 50% of each. Towards the end of the week, you're going to switch the other direction. So about 25% of the old feed, 75% of the new feed. And by the end of the week, you should be able to transition them over fully to the new ration. And again, that just helps kind of transition their room and over so it's not a big shock to them so they can go ahead and just adjust a little easier. Next slide. All right, and then our next type of finishing is gonna be our grass finishing. So with <laughs> grass finishing, you know, we have to have an honest moment again. And so you need to have the infrastructure required for pasture management of sheep and goats. And so with sheep and goats, you don't want to be just grazing on one section of pasture all the time. So that means you need portable fencing and you'll need a way to get water to those portable paddocks. It may be water lines, it may be a, a water tote that you carry with your tractor, but you need to have a way to get water there, you know, your mineral source. And yes, you have to have enough rain 
to keep your pasture growing. Additionally, you're going to have to have a good pasture management strategy. Make sure you have good fertility in your pasture and a good mix of, of forbs and grasses and legumes. You know, because sheep and goats aren't designed to finish just on grass alone. And one thing that's not on this slide that you have to consider is labor. You have to have the labor to be able to move that portable fencing to where you need it on a regular basis. And you know, typically you, want, you probably don't want to leave them in the same place depending on the paddock size for more than two weeks because a lot of your parasite life cycles are right around three weeks. And so if you can be moving these animals every two weeks, you can help break that parasite life cycle. And so one of the first things to consider if you want a pasture-based system is what breeds are you going to work with? And so there are a number of different breeds that you could consider, but think about those, you know, first of all, buy your breeding stock from somebody who has a pasture-based system. You are, it doesn't matter what the breed is. If you are buying breeding stock from somebody who's kept their animals in the barn, they're probably not gonna to transition to pasture very well. Or if you're buying weaned lambs or kids to raise on pasture, again, if you're buying them from somebody who raises all their stuff from the barn, you just put them out on pasture. They're not gonna know what to do with it. They're not going to know what to eat. They haven't been trained by their dam on what is safe and what's not safe to eat. And you're going to see significant weight loss. You're gonna see more stress and you're gonna see a higher parasite load on animals that are not already accustomed to pasture. And so some breeds that you'd consider with sheep would be the Dorper, which you know there are a lot of people who are using dorpers on pasture systems they don't have quite the parasite resistance that we're seeing in the katahdins and so katahdins are a more common breed and then a newer breed that's been developed as a hybrid between you know saint croix and some and katahdin and some other breeds is the royal white and so that's a breed of sheep that's been developed for muscling and to be able to put that muscling on on a pasture-based system and a lot of people who are using Dorper and Katahdin genetics, they'll, they'll be doing some hybridization and they'll, they'll cross the breeds to try to get a hardier animal. And so we're starting to get more sheep that are not a specific breed, but they are specifically developed on pasture genetics. And so you wanna look at your pasture genetics and where they're coming from more so than a specific breed. But in general, your hair sheep are going to do better in a pasture situation than your wool sheep are. Now, goat breeds, when we're talking about pasture finishing, we want to look at breeds that were developed, you know, on more for more of a forage-based system. And so when I think of pasture finishing, the breed that I would not use is the boar. Boars may be fine in a pasture-based system in West Texas, where you don't, where it's pretty dry and you don't have a lot of parasites. They're not going to do well in most pasture-based systems in Indiana or in the Eastern US in general. You know, because when you have more rain, you have more parasites and boars tend to be very susceptible to parasites. And so the Kiko was developed in New Zealand, which is a very wet country. And they do have a lot of parasites in New Zealand. And so it was bred for parasite resistance. And it was developed to be able to, and they do almost everything pasture-based in New Zealand. And so this is a breed that was developed to be able to finish out on pasture with minimal inputs. So the Kiko is a great choice of breed if you're looking for pasture finished goats. The Spanish goat is essentially the, the goat that's been here since the, the Spaniards first colonized in Florida and in the Southwestern US and, and other parts of, of the Americas. And so that's a smaller breed and they are more, you know, they are more adapted to a pasture based system than a lot of our newer breeds. Okay, so a question on pasture based system in Kikos is there a particular seed mix you suggest for reseeding a pasture? The seed mix that you want to use is going to vary based off of your location. So I know we have people who join this from all over the United States and Canada. And so you want something that's well adapted to your area. And so you want to make sure that you have high quality grasses. And so you don't want your, 
you don't want your Kentucky 31 fescue. You want, if you, if you're going to use a, a fescue, you want a friendly endophyte fescue. You don't want the toxic endophyte fescue. But bluegrasses, orchard grass, you know, high quality grass. If you're in the Midwest, orchard grass, Timothy, bluegrass. If you're in the South, you may be looking at, you know, Bermuda grasses during the summer and overseeding with an annual ryegrass in the wintertime or something like that for your grass. It just kind of depends on where in the country you are and what grasses grow well. But you also want to have legumes mixed in there and you want to have legumes that do well in your area. So here in Southern Indiana, where I live, the medium red clover is a common pasture legume. And that has to be seeded about every other year, you know, when, when you're putting that in pasture. But there are a number of different legumes you can use, but it's going to depend on where you live and what does well. And then for forbs, you might consider things such as chicory. And there are some other forage forbs out there. I know some in the South, some people are using sun hemp. But again, the, the key is if you're going to be pasture finishing, you want a mix of pasture species. But that's going to vary based off of where you are. Does that make any sense? Okay, and so the savanna goat, that's a breed that is relatively new to the United States. It was developed in South Africa, and it is it is supposed to be hardier than the boar, but I have not seen a lot of testing yet to see if it does actually have more parasite resistance than the boar. But that's definitely a breed to explore and to look at. It is a white goat that it looks basically like a white boar, and so it is a, a big muscular breed. And so that's a breed you might consider. And so I, I don't know what the level of parasite resistance is in that breed, but it is supposed to be hardier than the boar. And so that's a breed you might consider. So now, as we, as we talked about with questions, so the pasture, you need to have a nutritious, dense pasture with, and you need to have a decent percentage of legumes and other broadleaf plants. And so, like I said before, you can add in forbs such as chicory or sun hemp or some of these other pasture developed forbs. And you want to make sure that your pH is balanced. You don't want to have an extremely acid pH or a very basic pH. So with pH, plants will tolerate acid soils a little bit better than they will tolerate basic soils. So a pH of six to seven is ideal for pasture. And you want to put these animals on it at the right time of maturity. So you don't want to put these goats or sheep on pasture when it's over mature and it's gone to seed. You want to have a lot of leaf content. And again, if you're doing continuous grazing, they're going to run out of the desirable forage. You're going to see your rate of gain go down. You're going to see the, you know, the parasitism go up. And so you want to make sure that you are able to rotate your grazing so that they always have taller forage that they're able to, to browse on. And goats especially, they like to eat higher off the ground. Sheep will eat a little bit lower. Goats like to eat higher. And I mean, one option is to use them for cleaning up invasive species such as multiflora rose or honeysuckle. These are things that shouldn't have an effect on your meat. And it's a great way to keep them away from parasites as you are you know, finishing out your lambs or goats. And both lambs and goats will eat multiflora rows and honeysuckle. You want to make sure that they always have access to water and minerals. And so you need a way to move your water tubs. And so when I am, when I'm, you know, grazing animals away from the barn where they don't have access to the waters near the barn, I have a a smaller water tub, but then I have a big water tote that we can carry with the tractor and I have a hose attachment for the tote. And so I can set that tote there and I can just fill up the water trough from the tote. And then we can move that to the next area when we're ready to move these goats. You need to make sure that they have you know, some access to shade and shelter. Now, you know, it might be a wooded area, but you do not want to graze goats or sheep in a wooded area full time. You can use them for prescribed grazing for short periods of time to get rid of invasive species, but you do not want to leave them in the woods. And so it would be good to have a calf hutch or some other kind of shelter that you can put in a temporary paddock that you can move to the next area. And you want to make sure that they're healthy. 
So you don't want to put animals out there that are already showing signs of, of disease. You don't want to put animals that are showing respiratory problems or that have diarrhea or other issues. So you want to make, want to make sure that they're healthy before they go out in the pasture. And ideally they would have already been on pasture with their dams. So again, the four pillars to pasture finishing your lambs and kids is number one, the right genetics. So buy from someone who already has a pasture-based system when you buy your genetics. You know, buy a breed that's better adapted to a pasture-based system. And then make sure that they're growing well and they're healthy before you wean them. Because again, they will be under a lot more stress and, they'll, and the nutrition level is going to go down right at weaning because you're taking away the milk, which is very dense nutrition. Make sure they have a proper introduction you know, to grazing. So a grazing-based system is a great application of dam-led weaning because then, then you're not worried as much about that sudden change in nutritional status when they wean. And so if you want a pasture-based system, your best bet is to raise the dam with the lambs or kids all together. So you have your ewe flock, your ewes and your lambs together, or your does and your, lamb, and your kids together, and to practice that dam-based weaning so that you don't have a sudden change in nutritional status, and so that they get that proper introduction to the pasture. And the other key is you want to make sure that it's a pasture with species that they will eat that has a high level of total digestible nutrients. So you don't want to put them out on something that's basically straw. And again, a lot of your summer pastures get very dry. And so if you're doing pasture finish, if they're going to be out later in the season, you want to make sure that you have a good source of high quality hay or you, that you can supplement the pasture with. So if, you, if your goal is to do grass-fed, a forage-based system that does not include mature grains will count. So you can use silages in a pasture-based system as long as they're not mature grains in those silages. So if you need to increase your energy in, or your protein in your ration or on your pasture, you can supplement with a, with a grain silage for energy or a legume silage for protein. And again, those grain silages, those are going to be harvested before the grain is mature. And so those do fit the, the definition of a, of a forage-based system. And so that's something to consider if you are wanting to do grass-based, but you do need to increase those nutrients a little bit. Okay, and I'll let Alicia talk about show finishing. So obviously we have a lot of families across the U.S. that raise animals for their kids to show in 4-H or that they show in open shows themselves. So we'll just kind of briefly mention, um, these are a few key points from Purina. Um, I am not, not specifying Purina as the place to go. They just had some really good points that I wanted to share with you in terms of finishing an animal for a market show. So feeding our, our show lambs and kids basically involves just basic principles of nutrition. We need to remember that they are small ruminants first and foremost. Um, so that means we need to maintain their rumen health. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much in terms of forage, roughages, whichever you want to call it. Um, but it's important that we keep the forages as a part of their diet. Um, otherwise, you're going to have a roller coaster basically of feed intake, um, things like that, um, and it can it can cause growth and physical performance issues as well. So to feed, we want to make sure we feed a good quality forage. Um, so basically a couple handfuls, about four ounces, quarter of a pound, somewhere in there of good quality alfalfa hay a day is all that's really needed to keep that room and working in our goats and our kids or our lambs. So our poor quality forage basically takes a lot longer to pass through our digestive tract than something that is going to be a lot higher quality, like a good quality third or fourth cutting alfalfa. So feeding a low or moderate quality roughage puts on what we call the belly. So it increases that room and space and makes them kind of puff out a little bit. It doesn't create that nice sleek look that you may want on a market animal. 
So the higher quality alfalfa passes through faster um, and helps keep that, what we call that tubular appearance on those lambs where it's just a nice straight flat line going all the way down. Next slide. So we also have to look at what we call the fiber length or the length of those pieces of forage that we're feeding. Um, so ideally we'd like to have them about one and a half to two inches long. Um, so not that long but definitely bigger than what we're looking at if you're going to be feeding a pellet of some sort. So alfalfa pellets are a decent substitute for forages, but it's not quite the same as feeding a hay or a haylage, something like that. Um, so the alfalfa pellets and ground hay don't have the same neutral detergent fiber. So those are basically the fibers that are needed to help keep that rumen working, to keep it processing. Um, and a lot of times what we might notice if we don't have the right amount of neutral detergent fiber or NDF in our feed are, especially on lambs, they'll start chewing or pulling on wool of others. Um, could be a combination of them being bored um, because um, they don't have the right kind of roughage source, things like that. Um, they need that energy, that fiber that they can get from the larger forage, chunks of forages. Um, and so, but unfortunately, once you start seeing that wool chewing or wool pulling, um, it's really hard to get them to stop just because it becomes a habit at that point. You may adjust their forage, their fibers just fine, and they may, may be getting what they need. But once it, they start it, it kind of becomes a habit. So at that point, um, you'll need to keep your lambs covered, um, especially on the legs, um, the heads, things like that, if that's something that you're really needing, um, or separate them out to kind of stop that activity. And then again, water intake, like we've stressed, water is important, um, whether we're looking at pasture or grain finished or feeding show animals. Water, the better quality water, the better your animal is going to do. Um, so we want to make sure we have clean, fresh, abundant water that's just not too hot or not too cold, kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You want it just right. Um, and the intake of water can actually help prevent our urinary calculi as well. Um, it keeps those nutrients moving through the body, so they may be getting um, the, yeah, ammonium chloride. Is that it? Yeah. Um, yes. In the feed. Yeah. Yep in their feed but if they're eating it they still need it to move through the body so you want to make sure that they get that water that they need to help move those nutrients through all right next one. all right so when you're looking at something like show feeds these are the things you should be looking for that they should do and things that they're not going to do for you so basically they're going to provide kind of a consistent feed intake um, as long as you have that water and the roughage or the forage in front of them, um, it's it's going to be consistent across the product, especially if you buy the same similar show feed for the throughout the season. It's going to be it's going to be the same formula. So you don't have to worry about mixing your own feed and things like that. You should have adequate growth and development. Um, so these show feeds are developed to maximize basically the performance and the growth of these animals should have good physical appearance and the skin, the hair, the wool, things like that. Should have proper conditioning, especially if you exercise, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Um, should have basically the lamb or kid helping to, what they say, express their genetic potential. Um, so if you've done everything right, if you've fed right, then the, what you are getting as a result for that market animal is what that animal could become, um, is basically what it is. And then usually they'll, especially if you're looking at a market weather, um, so lambs or, or goats, should have some ammonium chloride in it to help address the urinary calculi issue. So the biggest thing with show feed is no matter what type of show feed, no matter what type of feed you're using, things like that, a good feed is not going to create more bone. It's not going to create more height on your animal. It's not going to thicken up those legs. It's in the genetics. It's not going to make your lamb or kid longer. It's not like um, it's not like it's you're putting them on a stretching machine and you're stretching them out. It's not going to be able to do that for you. 
you're not going to have an increase in your base width, your length of neck, your loin, um, anything along those. It's not going to, to do that. Your feet isn't going to do that for you. Um, and it's not going to strengthen a weak topped lamb. Um, so basically where they just break off behind the shoulders and don't have that nice flat rack and loin area. It's not going to do that. It's all in the genetics. So that's where you need to make sure that you're working with a good breeder. I might be getting ahead of myself. Let's go to the next slide, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you want to make sure that you're working with a good breeder, somebody that has good show stock, and see what they recommend for finishing out your lambs. They know um, if they're a good breeder what their lambs do best on or kids do best on, and they should be able to help direct you into that feed that will that will enhance what their herd is meant to do or flock. So, and then a lot of times you'll want to consider feeding a couple of animals together because um, small ruminants are considered a herd or flocking type animal. So two lambs or kids do much better feeding together or at least where they can see each other than if you're just feeding one by itself. Um, they kind of, kind of compete with each other. They kind of like to, um, it's kind of not necessarily a contest, but they just do much better when they have a companion or pen mate present. Um, and then we need to look at a consistent exercise program. So it's not necessarily, well, I was gonna say putting them on treadmills, some people do, um, but it's getting out there, it's working with those lambs and those goats, walking them, it just has to be even three or four times a week, but getting them used to walking, getting them used to leading, getting them out and moving. Um, if you have a little bit of a hill on your property, getting them used to kind of going up an incline, that'll help work that muscle as well. Um, so if you feed your animal right and things like that, but you don't work with them, you don't exercise them, that muscle will be there. It just won't be expressed to the best of its potential. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at a market lamb for a show, Ideally, your weight is going to be about 120 to 150 pounds. Again, this depends greatly on what type of breed you have. So this is going to be more of your commercial type market animals. So your suffix, your hamps, um, your crosses, things like that. Your little bit larger bodied lamb is what we're looking at here. So on average, um, you should be gaining about a half to three quarters of a pound a day, which doesn't seem like a lot but you need to have the right combination of grain, forages, water intake, things like that to get those gains to happen. So this is just a nice chart. Um, I think it was Utah State, um, just looking at what you would need to start with a younger lamb, a lighter weight lamb, how much grain you would need to be feeding, how much um, hay, um, what the percentage of protein is to get you to that finished weight of 120 to 150 pounds. So it's kind of a nice, just little chart to refer back to. Next slide. You wanna take this one, Sarah? <laughs> sure, these are not market meat goats, obviously. They're, they're dairy bucks, but they're gonna have a little bit, they're gonna be a little less efficient in their rate of gain in general but it'll take about seven pounds of grain for every pound of gain for goats. And so you're looking at about a quarter of a pound to 0.35 pounds per day average daily gain. And so you're looking at between 1.75 and two pounds of grain to in, ensure a quarter pound gain. And so you can, you, you can make your own chart similar to what Alicia showed for sheep to be able to look at your market weight for goats. So if you're looking at a, a market meat goat class where you're gonna want about a 70 to 90 pound goat for that class, you can use that to calculate how much do I need to feed to be able to hit this target weight. And just one thing to remember with both lambs and kids is you don't want to put an obese goat in a market class. You're gonna get docked for that. And so an obese goat or an obese lamb is not going to show well. So you want to make sure that they get the exercise, they're well muscled, and that they, so they're going to do well for you in that market class. You know, so we are about out of time. So we and we're about out of slides. So, yeah, so. <laughs> so again, um, just a reminder, just make sure you have the water. Um, no matter which type mm -hmm. of finishing you're doing, you need that water, that clean, fresh water. 
Um, and there are all sorts of resources out there looking at how to properly finish sheep and lambs and goats on not just grain, but pastures as well. So. so if you need to contact us, our contact information is here. And I do want to make a note that the survey that comes with follow up email is last month's survey. I did not get that updated. So you can, I will email in the next couple of days, I will email a survey to everybody who attended just to see you know, what you learned from today. But you will get a link to my YouTube channel. I will be, this was recorded. And so I will be posting this to the YouTube channel within the next few days. So everybody have a great month and hopefully we will see you next month for fencing for small ruminants.